Oh, you're speaking the language of conservation really well, which I, I think both of you really, whether you want to admit it or not, education is, is, a, is a core value. And I, I think what you guys are doing here, bringing these stories uh, to the forefront, no matter how big or small or remote or in the middle of uh, massive populations, uh, people need to know that this is going on. Um, and, and the positivity at, angle, right? So that's, that's where you're, you, you get your namesake from is from a positive story. Uh, th that's what keeps us going. In this episode of Conservation Conversations, we're going to do something a little different, but kind of the same. We are wrapping up our mini-series, Conservation on Fire, by just talking amongst ourselves. It's going to be Taylor and Austin of Pelicanus talking with Eric Zahn, a Pelicanus board member and past episode interviewee, about what we do in regards to fire and forest health, and then it kind of just morphs into a conversation about conservation in general and how and why Pelicanus got started. So thanks for listening. We hope you like it. I was going to say welcome, everybody, but it's all it's just us. So uh, thanks, uh, Eric, for, for joining Taylor and I today. This is going to be a little bit different episode where where instead of having a, a guest on to interview, we're going to have a guest on to interview us to talk about what we do uh, in terms of conservation and specifically uh, conservation uh, in fire. So, uh, Eric, do you want to introduce yourself? You know, you, you, you've been a past uh, 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 subject matter of a of, uh, past episode. So, you know, if people haven't listened to that one. You want to introduce yourself and uh, we can go kind of go from there. This is going to be a hot one, boys. I can't wait. <laughs> So yeah, uh, I'm a I'm a salt marsh ecologist. So you know, fire is actually something I'm not super comfortable with. But yeah, Eric Zahn, I'm the principal restoration ecologist for, for Tidal Influence. We do mostly wetland restoration, um, but uh, coastal habitats as a whole. Um, and and actually, uh, I, I was using some fire earlier to kill some non-native plants. So you know, fire's a super dynamic tool. Uh, something that humans have been using to benefit themselves in, in Southern California for for many years, uh, but now it's a, now it's a concern uh, for, for other reasons. So super stoked to hear about how that fits into what you guys do in conservation. Conservation is so many disciplines, right? And uh, I think if I would talk to you guys uh, a decade ago, fire probably wasn't at the, at the forefront of your, of your conservation interests. So uh, I'm stoked to hear about what you guys are up to. We've been friends for a long time in this field, but I, I actually don't know exactly what you're doing every day. So, so what's going on? You know, what's what's a, what's a day in the life like for a Parker brother? Yeah. So I, I guess I'll go first and then Taylor, I can kind of pass it off to you. But again, either one of you can can jump in and ask questions and ask for clarifying stuff as I kind of talk about what I do. Um, so technically, my title is a biologist. I work for the United States Ge Geological Survey um, in the San Diego office of the Western Ecological Research Center. And so the USGS has different uh, science centers. Uh, what people are more familiar with is like the water and actual geology and earthquakes. Like the earthquake center is, uh, I'm not sure what, I can't remember what it's called, but it's the one up here at Caltech in Pasadena. And they do a lot of volcano work in the, in the Hawaiian Islands. Um, but ours is a, an ecological research center, but we do salamanders, all the different lizards, um, small mammals, large mammals, uh, golden eagles, a lot of stream surveys. We do all the arroyo toad and western pond turtle. So like every, most species other than birds, except for eagles, um, we kind of cover in Southern California ecoregion. So basically from um, Santa Barbara down uh, to the border and some into the desert, but not as much, but we do do some desert salamander work. So yeah, we do a lot of different things in our, in our research center, but uh, as you can imagine in Southern California, all of these endangered species or pre-listing species or species that are of concern are affected by fire. Um, their, their habitats are, a lot of them are conditioned to burn and some of these species are really well adapted to it and some of them aren't. And as the fire regime has changed, um, the ones that are adapted are less adapted. And so it's just kind of a constantly moving thing. So about the, our lab started getting involved in post-fire work 
research in the late nineties. And when things started really ramping up with fire in Southern California, uh, and then after about 10, 15 years of that, they just kind of like, all right, we got to do something about this because there's got to be something be, to, to help reduce the impacts to these species. Um, and there are two major ways that the species and their habitats are impacted by fire. It's by the fire itself. It's by the actual fire effects. So like a really hot fire burns and it's moonscaped. And, uh, you know, if it burns too often, then it just a habitat change. So then, then those species just don't have a home anymore. And then the other way is by the suppression activities. So retardant drops, bulldozer lines, uh, everything they kind of do to contain the fire, to stop the fire from moving. Uh, and a lot of times, especially on smaller fires, a lot of times the impacts are almost all from suppression activities. So our, in late, early 2010s, we started, um, I say we, I wasn't here, but they uh, decided to all come together and talk about, okay, how do we help reduce the impacts to these species habitats and the actual species themselves. And there's a big symposium in 2013 and there's a, a document in 2014 that says, here's everything we have to do. And we all came together and like, we came up with a list of here's everything we got to do. And then uh, priority shifted in the federal government and it moved to drought and golden eagles and some other stuff. And then as fire kind of kind of come back into the forefront of people's minds, um, we're now implementing all those things that we had said we were going to do uh, about 10 years ago. So we're building this program. Um, and for the longest time, we, for the last few years, we've just been calling it our fire program. And we're trying to find funding to expand it. And people are kind of like, well, what do you call it? And we're like, oh, I don't know. We don't have a name. It's our fire program. And so like, it's the government. So people want an acronym. They want something flashy. And so we, uh, we talked with some of our outreach people and um, my boss's boss. And we kind of came up with a name called Sparks which is S-P-A-R-C-S. So it's Suppression and Planning Actions for Restoring Communities and Species. And we've got a cool logo of a little K-Rat with his little t tail tuft as a flame. And, and he looks angry. He looks like a, like a mascot. Um, this originally was uh, funded in, and still is funded by uh, a taxpayer program in San Diego County called uh, the San Diego M Management and Monitoring Program. It's a funded by SANDAG. Uh, which is San Diego area governments. So it's a whole county thing where you pay into it. And then, um, and so they started this, this program, but now we're looking to expand it outside of San Diego County and do more in the San Diego County because we can't take San Diego taxpayer money and work in different counties. Um, and so we're expanding that and we're trying to work in the entire Southern California eco region. So like I said, basically from, you know, Santa Barbara, the Los Padres National Forest, all the way down to the border, all the way to the, to the border of Arizona. Um, and this program has three aspects to it. It's the pre-fire planning, the incident response and post-fire research. The incident response, which is the resource advisor program. Uh, and as a resource advisor, what I do is like I, I am uh, assigned to active wildland fires. The resource advisor itself is kind of the one that's at camp and it works with the ops and the planning sections that are doing all the, you know, actual trying to figure out how to uh, stop the fire and, and uh, you know, planning for contingency, those kinds of things. And the reads in there talking with them and saying like, hey, this is a really sensitive area. Can you avoid that area? Or, you know, where did you put stuff? Because we need to know what damage is, is uh, potential, potentially out there. Um, and then below that, or I'm saying below that, but those, the people that work for the reads are the reefs, uh, Fireline Resource Advisor. And those are people that are actually on the line. They're with the crews, they're with the heavy equipment, they're with whoever, and they're actually driving around, walking around, mapping a lot of this damage, um, you know, depends on the, the time of the fire. If it's the initial attack, then they're out there with them saying like, you know, you got to put a dozer line there, but can you move it that way a little bit? Because that's critical habitat for a toad or something like that. And we're saying like, Hey, can you not run your dozer through this Creek bed, this dry Creek bed back and forth, back and forth, just because, you know, you're trying to stop the fire when it's like, this is, you know, prime habitat for pond turtles and toads and spade foot or whatever. And so that's ideal is when we can get there and early and help them make decisions. 
Um, but it's not always not possible because sometimes, you know, these firefighters, they're, they're there within 20 minutes sometimes. Um, and so, you know, we get called once it kind of gets to a bigger size and then we're like, okay, let me get out there. Let me grab my gear. And then let me drive all the way out there. And by the time, like if we're lucky, it's six hours later, um, it, usually the next day or two days later that we're, we're there. So well, a lot of times what we do is we help with the, the, the final stage of the fire, which is called suppression repair. So when they put those lines and they, they do all the containment lines and everything, they're like, hey, it's, 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 you know, there's still heat, but the fire isn't moving. Then they start suppression repair. So they go to all these lines and they, um, if they can, they pull all the soil back on top. They put, pull all the, um, the organic material, all the slash that the dozers pushed off the sides and you pull it back over that line. So it recovers much quicker. Cause if the idea of putting these lines in is you get it all the way down to mineral soil. So the fire, even if it's not a windswept chaparral fire where it's just moving, you know, super fast, it's going to still have heat in it. And so it won't smolder and, and, uh, kind of creep because it, there's nothing for it to burn. So fire needs fuel, right? So when that they can call that line contained, they can pull all that slash and soil back on top because if it's just the rock and mineral soil, that's going to take hundreds of years to recover. And if they pull everything back, it could be 10 or 20, 30 years. And a lot of times this is really sensitive habitat and it really depends on where it is. It could be critical habitat for a species. It could be like capital W wilderness, which is like makes way more, way harder to do anything. Um, so, but then the, the last aspect to our, our, the sparks program is this post fire research this is what we, how this all started is, you know, going into these areas and, um, surveying for species and surveying these creeks and seeing like how the water chemistry, uh, is changed and are the species still there and that you try to do it early and then you do it, you know, every few years afterwards to see how certain species have uh, adapted or not adapted to a fire coming through. Like a good example is in Southern California, we've had those three fires that were in early September and they were all burning at one time. And, um, but the bridge fire in the Angeles national forest in 2020, the Bobcat fire burned like 30,000 acres or 50,000 acres. And it burned up a lot of the mountain yellow-legged frog, um, areas and so we, we did a big response we pulled a lot of the frogs out of these areas because the fire probably didn't kill the frogs but what happens later is when it starts raining all that material from the hillsides just sloughs off into the creek and it fills the creek and there's no more creek or it severely changes the water chemistry and then they die that way um, so they pulled all those frogs out and they put them in the san diego zoo the santa Ana zoo the la zoo and the aquarium of the pacific in long beach and they're doing head starting programs and they're, they're doing captive breeding and they're trying to like keep the species alive. And then over the last four years now, I've been slowly putting those frogs and their progeny back into other areas. And then some of the areas back into the bobcat um, fire area. So it's like, Hey, this is great. We're recovering the species. And then the bridge fire happened, sorry, the line bridge fires in the Angeles forest, that fire happened and it burned over everything. <laughs> so every good population of Mount Yellowhead frog has now been impacted again. So it's, uh, this is the kind of stuff that we do is to, to go in and research that and kind of track changes. Yeah. Burning question. I'm just fascinated by having a, as we said, you're, you're, you're the biologist, the governmental scientist, having them, having you out there, uh, interfacing with an emergency right and and humans in large pieces of equipment and I, I just see this phenomenon when you put people in construction equipment telling them what to do is often very challenging if not an option and especially like hey kind sir uh, there's a frog <laughs> right here in this creek can you like not run over it like, no we're trying to fight a fire here um so i want to know that that part of the program like what kind of challenges exist and also your, your previous experience you have experience being on that other side fighting the fire does that does that help at all um you know how do you how do you bridge that gap yeah it that's probably the hardest part of the job is conveying the concerns and the importance of these concerns to people that presumably don't care you know they a lot of times these people are sitting in a dozer and they're literally the fire is pushing toward them and they're pushing downhill. They're, they're just trying to go where they can and they're just trying to stop the fire. 
And so in that situation, they're not worried about frogs and we're not worried about the frogs or whatever property and uh, sorry, life and property comes first always. And then safety of the crews and, and the people involved, that's always pr top priority. But then, then our next step is like, if we can reduce impacts, that'd be really great. But so that is the, the big challenge is like, how do you get this across? And I started this 10 years ago, 2015 was my first fire up in Oregon. And even since then, it's changed drastically. People actually care. And I think it's because of just the growth of the read program and the more people work with good reads throughout the nation. This is a national program. Um, the more they realize that we're not out there to be stop signs. Good reads, I should say. Good reads are not out there to be stop signs. We It's all about compromise. It's all about understanding that they have their mission. They have their objectives. But we have our objectives and we're just trying to figure out where they align. But we're, like I said, we're not out here to say, no, you can't do that. That's why it's called resource advisor. We're advising. We're saying, hey, I know this is the best line. This is the most direct line, but can we not go direct? And can we kind of make a, you know, a little bit bigger? So more will burn, but the, you know, seven blade wide dozer line won't go through a vernal pool or whatever the resource is. Or there's also a lot of cultural resources. And so we can say, hey, there's a cultural site right there. If you bulldoze that up, it's now gone forever. Uh, and like I said, it's changed a lot. And people, and even just in the last few years where we've started the Sparks program and we're working with CAL FIRE in San Diego, we have a great relationship with uh, San Diego CAL FIRE. And our CAL FIRE rela our relationship with CAL FIRE in Riverside is really getting better. Like I said, it is hard to say like, hey, this is the last population of Hermes copper. Can we not bulldoze it? And they're just like, I don't give a about a butterfly, but it's like, okay, but objectively there's no difference between putting a dozer line here or there. It's just an extra quarter of an acre that's going to burn. So can we put it there? <laughs> you know? So it's, it's, it's a tough one. Um, and like I said, it's gotten better and, definitely gotten people where you're you know, pointing in your face and yelling and you're like, I, you know, it's okay. You know? So it's uh yeah, that is the challenge of the job. <laughs> Do you ever have to choose between resources? Like, uh, you know, like if you go there, then it'll impact this and that. But if we go there, it'll impact this and that. My favorite thing is this. So, you know, we're going to go in that direction. <laughs> Do you ever have those choices where there's a lot of resources and you kind of just got to not pick your favorite necessarily, but you know, the, the one that's the, 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 having the biggest challenges, like you said about the, the, the butterfly. Yeah. I've never, I've never experienced like, Hey, there's an Arroyo toad population right there. And there's a butterfly habitat right here. Which do we choose? It's not like the, the, the trolley thing, you know, that the trolley problem, but there is definitely like, okay, we have to prioritize what our resources are like, Hey, this is a keynote checker spot, critical habitat. And we know this is the best population in Riverside, but then just south of that is capital W wilderness. It's the beauty mountain BLM wilderness. It is like pristine habitat. There's mountain lions. There's all this cool stuff. It's kind of like, so what is more important? Yeah. Community or species is, a, is always one of our biggest debates in this field, right? right. Are we, we try to protect communities and keep them intact or, you know, just because one species is using this spot and it's not that great of a, a community, but it's really serving this one species. Is, is, does that take precedence? Yeah. And so that's where we just kind of have to work as a team. And um, I think, like you said, the hardest part is the communication with the team. But what comes with that is they say, what do we do? And you have to you have to say what are we, what we're going to do, you know, and you can't go, let me you can. But it's like usually they're just going, all right, cool. Well, I'm going to go do what I want then if you can't give me an answer. And so you have to answer that question right away. And so the hard part of, again, I keep saying what that's the hard part. I guess it's a difficult job, <laughs> but uh, is you have to answer that question. And so they're going, Hey, I know I saw on your map that there's a population of a rare plant here. Uh, you know, what do we need to look out for? And you're like, I've never even heard of this plant before, but you're like, I'm the expert. Let me tell you what to do. And so you're now the subject matter expert for Kino checker spot for some rare plant or a row toad. And so you kind of, it, it, it takes a lot of, um, uh, flexibility and just kind of, you know, like Star Wars, like remember your training, you're just kind of like, 
I have ecological principles in my head about what is important and you those can apply to a lot of different things. Um, and so it, you kind of have to like really quickly go back to your basics and then build up your decision from there and go, okay, yes, we would like you, or actually it'd be better if this burns. And we have a lot of areas like, like a burrowing owl, burrowing owl, uh, habitat, let it burn. We want it to burn. We don't want bulldozers going through there and uprooting all their little burrows. Same with uh, small mammals. So it really just, you have to like know a little bit. And luckily I have done a lot of different work <laughs> throughout Southern California to where I could come into this fire thing. And um, it's a it's actually a really good use of my variety of experience and, and skills. So, yeah. The other part of your program that I'm particularly interested in is the the more restorative aspect i think it was the the third prong that you had described as a restoration ecologist uh, you know we're often not given the luxury of trying to stop the impacts the impacts happen we come in and and, and try and use our, our 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 best knowledge and science to to repair these systems uh, and often we don't live long enough to just to, to see what that actually does right uh, but I, you know, I'm curious if you have seen or heard of any instances where, yeah, there is a population or, or or a community that that was rare, and uh, it was a big bummer that the fire came through, but but then it actually ended up allowing for that species or community to to thrive even more because maybe some non-native species were beat back or um, some overaggressive chaparral was taken down. Any any experiences that you've heard or seen or been a part of along those lines? Yeah, uh, we we talked to um, Katie Delaney of the National Park Service up in Santa Monica Mountain National Recreation Area, and they did a lot of that work uh, on the Woolsey Fire in 2018 to recover the red-legged frog, another endangered amphibian in Southern California. And um, it wasn't quite what you're saying, where like now the fire came through and oh, it's so bad, and hey, now it's great, but the the species in these these areas were able to recover and didn't kill the frogs. I know since then, since our talk with her, one of the areas did with our, all of our rain we got last few years, one of the area uh, pools did fill, which is a bummer. Um, but some of the other areas are doing really, really well. So yeah, it just depends on the species. It depends on, on what you're, what you're looking at, because sometimes, um, like, a example, Kino checker spot, it, like you said, it's chaparral and it, 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 um, it encroaches on. So, so the Kino checker spot is a tiny little butterfly and its host plant is this tiny little plant called Plantago erecta. And it's like just annual plants, really small. And so it kind of needs open space. It needs a different uh, habitat type. And if the chaparral, large shrubs start to encroach on it, it kind of just disappears and it doesn't get in the, the sunlight and the open space it needs. And so that's part of the fire ecology of the, the regime here is the fires come through, they burn it, and they open up everything, they regenerate all of that um, those nutrients that you know burned end up in the soil, and then those fire follower species come back, and it opens them up, and so then their species, their their um, populations can thrive. So that is one where it becomes an issue is just um, recently out in Riverside, there's a really, really good population of Kino checker spot that burned last year on the Bonnie fire. And there's, you could see the line where it burned. And then this year, the Nixon fire burned right up to it. And so, which if it burned right up to it, it's like what, whatever, but it did burn within the, the fire pr footprint of the Bonnie fire. And so that small, you know, acre or two, whatever it is in that Kino checker spot critical habitat, those butterflies are probably gone because it burned twice in 12 months. And so that's where climate change and the uh, fire regime changing is the biggest issue is like the frequency of fires, because then it just turns into a type change of habitat, which is a, a bummer. <laughs> that, that, that frequency is, is, is real. And, and uh, the size of these fires as well, I think is leading to having places burn more frequently than they, than they would have, in the past, I'm actually sitting in the footprint of the Thomas fire right now um, yeah. in a trailer. Ironically, that is in the place of two trailers that got incinerated. Luckily, luckily those trailers were, were full of rats. Um, but you know, <laughs> the, that fire came through, you know, hot and heavy, um, and it, it created this this um, awesome moonscape here. At the time, 
uh, in 2017, the Thomas fire was the largest fire in California history. And, you know, everyone was like, well, that, that was a big fire. Now it's, it's probably lucky if it's in the top 10. Right. And so how will you right. respond? How, how can you have the resources to respond to these fires that have these big areas that they're consuming? And then there's there's multiple large fires that happen at the same time um, yeah. in, in many instances. How do you how do you have a response team for the ecological aspects with, with so much going on, so much space? Yeah, that's the hard part. And then you get too many of them too many years in a row and the state goes broke, <laughs> you know, and the federal agency has to come in and like they they don't might not have the money aside for it. I, so I was actually assigned to the Thomas fire for a couple of weeks. Uh, it was over Christmas and it uh, yeah, I I worked all over all the way from the back end where the condors are to the front end where where, where you live now. And it um, it was vast and it, they, you know, there's just a spider web of dozer lines and all these ridges that we had to go, you know, check and make sure there was no damage and, you know, kind of, pres you know, prescribe repair for it. But that's a good question because that's actually part of our program. I said the, the incident response is the resource advisor program is I am coordinating the Southern California cohort of resource advisors. Our, my email list is like 120 people um, out of those people that are qualified resource advisors. I don't know how many there is, probably 20 or 30 of them, um, but we're trying to get more people qualified outside of the federal government as well. So it's California State Parks, CDFW, um, and, and other agencies don't have this program. It's a federal program, and CAL FIRE doesn't have resource advisors. So we're trying to build our program and just slowly infiltrate all these non-federal fires. And so... Like I said, I'm, I'm coordinating the, 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 that cohort and we meet quarterly and we are incorporating training aspects to each meeting, but also just as a discussion because we want, and not only just the read cohort, it's also CAL FIRE incident commanders and planning checks and chiefs and these big people that make decisions on these fires. They're, they come in there and go, fire's moving that way. Here's where we're going to put this. Here, we're going to have retardant drops here, whatever. So we want to meet them ahead of time and we want to have a good relationship with them and we want to talk with them multiple times a year so we're not meeting at 6 30 a.m the morning of the fire you know, the second day of the fire where it's now we started at 50 acres and now it's 10,000 acres and it's moving and it's moving toward a house a uh, housing community so we want to have this relationship so they know us they know that we're not saying here's a stop sign you got to do what i say because there's a, a dangerous species so that's the the idea behind the cohort and Actually, it's very similar to, um, I'll share my screen here. So this is our pre-fire planning map here. And this is an online database that feeds into the programs that firefighters use in San Diego County. Um, and so when they open up their tablets or their computer or their phone, they have access to this database. So um, we have all the conservation managed land uh, uh, borders here in uh, San Diego County. And I can't show details because this is like some, you know, non-public data, but like, for example, example, this is ecological reserve. And so if you go here, you can see what these, uh, roads. So this is the infrastructure. This is the initial attack, um, type, uh, map here. So when they show up, they'll know they can open up this map and say like, here's where a road is because we would rather them build a containment line off of a road or a trail or something that's already existing than just bulldoze through habitat. And so on here, we say like, here's what type of engine you can drive on it safely. So they, they'll know, so they don't have to go have a throw a person out to go scout it. Um, and so there's infrastructure, things like water sources is a good place for a, a camp. There's another, is a dipping site, some gates. And if you click on these, it'll tell you, say what the, uh, the code is. And this is not public. This is just for firefighters. Um, but then, um, where we come in as biologists is we have these resource avoidance areas. So they're just red hash marks. And so if you click on them uh, and they pull them up on their phone, it'll say, you know, this is butterfly habitat, you know, no dozers. Or we say, um, to do no, um, no retardant. If you need to drop anything, only water, those kinds of things. And if it is important to the telling the story, we'll say what it is. So like some of these are like burrowing owl habitats, like just let it burn. We'd rather this burn than you put dozers through it. And so the idea is that we have this for all of Southern California, 
uh, we want this for the entire Southern California eco region, and we want all this infrastructure mapped. So fire fighters can make better decisions to use the infrastructure in place rather than to, you know, just do spider with a dozer line. And then the flip side of that database is our second database, which is the resource advisor database that we're, we're, we use as resource advisors to go out there. And we have um, a lot more, a lot more specific data. So like, I won't turn it on because it takes forever to turn on, but it slopes over 40%. So if it burns through like a really uh, steep area, we need to know because then we need to look at what's below that. If it's critical habitat for toads or something, then we know that next time it rains, that's going to get filled in. So we might have to do some sort of mitigation there. Um, all of the species of concern for animals and plants, we have this data here. <laughs> it's pretty big. Uh, this database is getting updated soon. Um, and so you can click on each one of these. It'll tell you what it is. So this map helps us make decisions on repair, and uh, it has a lot more detail than the, the first map. And uh, like I said, here's critical habitat. So each one of these is critical habitat for a different species. Like out here is bighorn sheep. Uh, I think this is Kino checker spot butterfly. So we need to know because that's a legal designation by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Like this is critical habitat. So it helps us make decisions on what equipment to use. Do we use equipment? Do we use hand, uh, hand crews? Those kinds of things. Um, ultimately, the whole thing is to reduce impacts to, to species. Isn't it crazy how people, we, we work with people like all the time as conservationists, right? It's like, you think you're a wildlife biologist, or you're a botanist and you'd be like dealing with animals and plants, but no, it's like, we just deal with people all the time to try and like, achieve these crazy, as you mentioned, hard missions. Uh, I, I was really interested to hear about your capacity building aspect and trying to get more people doing what you're doing is, is a very specialized thing that this program that you started and your knowledge and, and Taylor, maybe you can jump in on this too, like the importance of mentoring people and, and sharing, you know, the only way that we're successful in our conservation efforts is by, by sharing. And that's like, you know, if you work for Silicon Valley, you're trying to keep the secrets for yourself, right. So that you can do better than other people. And it's this competition. And we know that we can't do it by ourselves. So we have to teach other people and bring them along uh, so they can help us do our bigger job you know it, 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 that seems like a critical path for for so much conservation and, and, and it's, it's for, for this as well yeah, yeah i no i totally agree and i think along those lines too um austin i have a question for you like um when you're out on a fire, do you mind talking about what that looks like? What is that day to day? Like, what is that talking about people talking about people you're working with? Are you solo? Are you flying solo? Are you um, out there for a couple hours and you just check out? Are you out there for 16 hours? Are you working with all kinds of people? Um, because I don't, it's kind of to Eric's point. I don't think a lot of people understand that. I mean, you do have a weird job. You're not a firefighter, but you are a firefighter. You are a wildlife biologist, but you're not really doing wildlife biology. Like what, like, what does that look like? No, yeah, you're, you're right. It's, it's a very strange thing. Um, so yeah, the day-to-day -day, uh, briefings at seven, sometimes it's briefings at six. <laughs> and so you usually start around six, <coughs> excuse me, you usually start around 6 a.m., go to briefing and it's like a, the, everyone that's important is at this briefing and they just, they go through the whole list of like fire behavior, weather, all those kinds of things. And then you do division breakout. So they break out those fire perimeters into the, the, the divisions. And if it's a big fire, they do it branches. So then you get separated out into your division. And uh, if you're lucky, you know where you're going to go that day. So you go talk to that division supervisor and you say, Hey, I'm going to be out here looking at this. And they go, great. And then usually plans change every 15 minutes until you're actually out there. And then when you're out there, things change again. Um, so you do the briefing and then usually you go to go, do it, grab a quick breakfast. You go back to your reed trailer or reed tent or reed <laughs> circle in the dirt. And uh, you kind of either pair up or you check in back in with uh, the rest of your team. If you have a team, I've been the only read on multiple fires. So kind of just like, I'm just flying solo. Um, and then you drive from, this is at uh, something called ICP incident command post, which is like, they set up a camp somewhere. And sometimes it is just the back of somebody's truck or, uh, recently on the airport fire, it was at Irvine great park. So it's a giant park and it's just basically a big, uh, pit <laughs> that everyone's parking in. Um, 
And so then you drive out to the fire and usually it's like crazy dirt roads. You get to go up these crazy hills and then you meet the division again out in the field. And then you start pointing at things and say, I'm going to go here. I'm going to walk that dozer, <laughs> dozer line. And, uh, and again, the plans are just constantly changing. And a lot of times what you were told by your supervisor uh, is different to what you see in the field, to different to what you're being told by the division supervisor. And so you kind of just have to piece everything together. And you're usually out there till about five or six, you come back to camp and sometimes it's a two hour drive back to camp. <laughs> um, so then you do evening briefing with your team and you run down everything you saw. And then you usually come up with a, a, a loose plan for the next day. And then you grab dinner and you're usually done by 10. So it's a full 16 hour day. Usually sometimes it's shorter. Um, and then cycle starts again the next day and it, you know, whatever you had for that loose plan, the next for the next day, usually it's a little bit different. Sometimes it's the exact same. So, you know, that's lucky when that happens, but you just do that. And each assignment can be up to 14 days. Um, and you can, you can expand or sorry, extend up to 21 days, which I've done once before and being on a fire, the same fire for 21 days straight is, uh, it's awesome. And you do get paid pretty well, um, as a federal employee, but, it uh, it eats it eats at your soul <laughs> just doing that so many days in a row, um, and you definitely need some sleep by the time you get back. So, and again, each say, fire assignment is is completely different. Sometimes you're just hiking dozer line like five ten miles of dozer line, and it's like dozer line is not trail; it's straight up, straight down, um, and you're just doing that all day for ten days straight. Or and sometimes you're just kind of driving around, looking at stuff and sitting in your car, waiting for someone to call you on the radio. So you have the radio, so everything goes through here. Um, and it's all about safety and accountability. And, you know, the, the last thing anyone wants to do is to, you know, lose their life or get injured because they're trying to save a butterfly. So, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, it sounds like you, you really got to like it because it's hard, long and, uh, probably hot. <laughs> and smoky um yeah so you you really gotta like what you're doing and really believe in it to to get out there and get, yeah. get on the front lines <laughs> yeah it's either super hot or super cold like i said that thomas fire it was free because it was over christmas and, you know you know how it is in southern california or in december like you get those cold snaps and it's super dry at the same time so that's why these fires start so like you know you wake up and you get out of your tent and it's 40 degrees and it doesn't get uh, up above 60 which, you know, isn't that cold relatively to the rest of the country. But if you're outside and it's windy and you're like, this is freezing and you're like going up and down. Like you said, if you're near the fire, you're just breathing in smoke or, you know, a lot of times, like I said, they, those dozer lines, they go down to mineral soil. So when you step on it, it's like moon dust it just puffs up and you're breathing in dust all day. So yeah, it's, um, it can be really hard, but it, I, I really like it. I think it's really fun. Um, as I said, I don't really have like a specialty in terms of what I do, um, for, biology and so this has just kind of become my specialty is this like a specialty of generalization but geared toward fire <laughs> and that's one of the things i wanted to talk about i i really find the field of conservation fascinating because of all the different disciplines that are involved with conservation of natural habitat and I, you know Having both of you here, you have two different stories of how you got involved in conservation and, you know, two different approaches. Uh, Austin's probably more prototypical and, you know, his academic path initially and, and his interest as a biologist. But then, you know, Taylor, I, I love your story as well of your academic path and actually now you surpassed us by leaps and bounds <laughs> academically. Um, but you started off in a, you know, in a, in a different realm and then fell into you know, the, the social conservation and the things. And, and so, yeah, it's funny that we, we, we have a hard time defining ourselves sometimes because we've tried and done so many different ways to just get into conservation efforts and, and help them along. No, I agree. I think that's what's so cool about this field is it's so varied and there's so many different things you can do. You know, you can be really interested in fire recall or you can be really interested in just, and if you want to just become a small mammal biologist, you just got to like, it's going to suck for 10 years. You're not going to make any money, but you could eventually become that small mammal biologist if that's all you want to do. I have ADD, I guess. So I just kept bouncing around and in the end it worked out for me <laughs> because every job I've had in the last few years, last 10 years has been, you know, you're just 
the catch all, you know, hey, help us with these permits, help us with these proposals, yeah, fire. Sure. Okay. You know, so I just kind of end up doing that. Um, but you know, like you said, Taylor started off doing something completely different and, uh, just, you know, taught himself. So yeah, I'm tired of talking. Let's talk, talk to Taylor. <laughs> yeah. Taylor, how the hell did you end up where you are, man? What are you up to these days? Yeah, no, both of your points, Eric's and, uh, yours, your point, Austin are, um, they're, they're both really, you know, poignant, um, getting started in this field and, and then having other people understand what you do in this field is weird. I remember Eric, when you and I started, um, I would tell people what I would do. I'd be like, oh, I'm into restoration. And everyone's response was, oh, like houses. And it was just like, wait, what? <laughs> um, or for the longest time, like I would tell people like, oh, I'm in, I'm into conservation and, you know, building wetlands. And I, I literally have had multiple people and family members say like, oh yeah, Taylor's a park ranger. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> no, I didn't say that at all. <laughs> um, so it is, it's, it's, it's weird. It's a weird job and it is fascinating. Um, and you know, it takes all kinds. Um, and I think also in the field too, we see that like some of the best conservationists that we think of, you know, even Bill McKibben, you know, he's a volunteer firefighter professionally. Um, uh, I don't know. There's so many others that are coming to my mind. Um, who are the Patagonia folks, Austin? Um, well, the Chenard and uh, Tompkins. Tompkins. There you go. Yeah. Tompkins ran a, a retail clothing line. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, these are some of the like bigger conservationists in mind. And so they all have these different um, and strange backgrounds. But I, I think I and mean, I'm definitely biased because my background is is weird. Um but I think that helps. It helps like give a, a variety of perspectives and a variety of uh, ways that we can approach these things because conservation hasn't been figured out. Um, we don't know how to do it. We don't know how to live with other species well. We don't know how to live with other habitats well. We're doing the best we can in some cases and in some cases we just don't care. Um, but we haven't figured it out yet. Um, one one of my mentors who taught me because I, I technically I'm a conservation social scientist, um, so I don't specialize in a particular habitat or species. Um, I I focus on the relationship between um, humans and their relation and their relationship with the natural world. And one of my mentors, uh, the way that she described it to me, described what a social conservation social scientist is. She said. What do humans hate? They hate being told what to do. What do we do in conservation? We tell people what to do. <laughs> and what they've done wrong. And, yeah, exactly. And what they're doing wrong. Yeah. And so that's kind of, I don't know. I, I have this perspective where too much of conservation is run by like glorified accountants. Right. And so we see conservation as, um, we have this many trees. Good job. We have, well, we don't have enough butterflies. Let's get more butterflies. And is that science? I don't know. It kind of just feels like glorified accounting. Um, and for me, the coolest people in conservation are the, the firefighters that are working to, you know, save, save the butterflies, uh, the people building the wetlands um, up and down Southern California, but all those amazing heroes around the world. And so it's, yeah, there's an intelligence that's necessary. There's a science that's necessary, um, but it's this opportunity to save species. It's this opportunity to build habitats. It's this remarkable job where we get this, you know, without waxing poetic too much, it's we get this opportunity to do things that really humans haven't had the opportunity to do before this last generation or two. It's only been a couple of generations where people are actually like putting the resources and the value in the and ontologically seeing the world differently to where we go, oh, we should actually protect trees. Oh, we should actually protect species. You know what you're talking yeah. about, Taylor? Is something that you really hammered on me when I didn't even know I was a conservationist. I, I was just a academic, right, that liked to study plants. Um, and, and you started teaching me about the culture of conservation. And 
and that it often doesn't exist and someone has to create it. Otherwise nobody knows what the hell they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I do think it is a culture because it is, because it is weird. It's, it's very different. Um, people that, I think it was Katie Delaney, actually, when we interviewed her, she said, everyone I know, everyone I work with is trying to save the world. Like what other profession is like that? That's a weird one. Well, um, and you it's know, also you, weird too, because now other professions and expertise are getting involved. Like we work with, uh, we did the interview with uh, Peppermint Narwhal. It's artists saying, yeah. how can I take my skills and help, you know? And obviously we're conservationists, but we're doing a podcast. So it's, it's a similar kind of thing where it's like, it's not just nerds looking at a computer screen anymore. We're still nerds looking at a computer screen, but it's a lot of other people trying to, trying to help. Yeah. And E.O. Wilson, you know, RIP, uh, he <laughs> called it consilience. And so for him, it was the scientists figure out the truth in the world and the humanities and the rest of us, we figure out how to deal with that truth. And, you know, we can figure out how many, you know, what, what are the population dynamics of a butterfly or a wolf or whatever, but then how do we figure out how to live with those wolves? How do we figure out how to live with those butterflies? And, you know, at what point is an endangered butterfly, uh, so important to us that we're going to change the way that we fight fires or change where we build homes? But I think even to the culture component and where the culture actually can speak to the larger culture, American culture, global culture, whatever, is almost flipping the script a little bit and not saying like, oh, well, why is this butterfly so important? But then like actually saying like, holy hell, I get to work on a butterfly. We get the opportunity as humans to care about something that's not us. That's a level of altruism that you don't see in other like aspects of human culture. Exactly right. And you, you know what I love about talking to Taylor again as, as a more <laughs> uh, science academic person is he comes in with all these quotes from these books I haven't read. And I don't know how much your listeners know about like where he came from originally. What's your original degree in Taylor, your, your first degree? <laughs> That you barely got. <laughs> Look at yeah. what's behind him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I dropped out of school three. I dropped out of my undergrad three times uh, because I couldn't figure it out. Um, and uh, eventually, probably against my own will, really, uh, finally finished my my undergraduate degree in um, comparative world literature, and uh, with an emphasis on. Hold on, this is. Here's how pretentious we can get. With an emphasis on cultural studies comparing the magic realism art of Russia to the magic realist art of Latin America. So conservation minded. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that was far more interesting uh, to me than um, it's ironic now because I teach at Cal State Long Beach, the place where I got my undergraduate degree, and I teach environmental science. Um, but when they were building the environmental science program, it was so boring. I was just like, they wanted to talk about economics. And that is so critical. It's so important. It's so necessary. And I'm finding myself fascinated by it now, like gen genuinely on an intellectual exercise. But that's not going to speak to the heart of why you're doing it. Like, that's not going to speak to the, like when you're, on that random Tuesday when you're having a hard time waking up in the morning and being like, Oh my God, I got to go do my job. Because no matter how amazing your job is, you still got to wake up and do it when, when the rest of the responsibilities are there. And it's not going to be like, Oh man, I can't wait to run that algorithm. <laughs> it's going to be like, Oh dude, like I get to see this endangered species come back from the brink of extinction, or I get to protect this habitat that has been under threat for decades. And that's special. And, and that's actually the people like ask me all the time, like, well, you know, what's, what's it all about? What, what do you get out of it? And it's those I'm living the dream moments yeah. that keep me in this field. Cause it's hard to the things I have to do yeah. <laughs> to run payroll, to, to do <laughs> actually a lot of the economics <laughs> crap, you know, just to, to, <laughs> to, to make a living and help give other yeah. people a job. It sucks. 
Um, but then there'll be that moment where I'm paddling across the bay uh, and uh, heading over to some some dune somewhere. And I'm like, hey, wait a second. Um, uh, I'm getting paid to do this and <laughs> yeah. I'm making an impact that's bigger than me. And I'm sharing this with other people that I like. And we're going to go back and tell stories about this years from now. That's the live in the dream moment. And, yeah. and you know, <laughs> that, that, that circle uh, in the dirt, the tent that, that, that Austin has to sleep in, um, you know, those are places you, you'll never get to go back to and you never would have gone to if right. it wasn't for what you do, right? The places that this take this conservation world takes us, it, those living the dream moments, that's, that's the win. That's the success yeah. in my mind. It's, it's crazy because, like I was saying, so my normal, you know, half of my job is this kind of like, basically administrative work so i've now you know my i said my title is biologist but i'm now like a contract specialist and a budget specialist and and i write proposals and i build budgets and i'm like i don't i was never trained for any of this and it's like not as fun but when i get those fire assignments right like hey we need you to do some field work this spring i'm like okay and like i can just be out there and just be like oh that's all your problem now (laughs) good luck with that (laughs) it's like i'm gonna put my out of office on my email and i'll be back in two weeks and i can fix help fix those problems later but right now not my problem well but but even then though the budgets that you're working on are budgets for rare species and so even then like i mean and again not taking anything away from that because it is hard it is really challenging and you know all the zoom meetings and budget meetings that we have they are necessary and important but it's also recognizing like those are still budget and Zoom meetings that are for rare species. And that's a, and again, that's a very different experience. And underlying that, you know, the paddling across the bay, uh, the, you know, the golden eagle um, outcrop, but even the budgets and the, and the, the computer work, I think there's something that goes with that that is foundationally psychological is is like a meaning and purpose and that meaning and purpose that comes with this job is is it's hard to replicate you know and i do want to hear about your program with uh, sna taylor but real quick that is one thing that i do tell people a lot where like they're either my age or like they went to school for something completely different and like like we were you know we're, we're kind of <laughs> clowning on a accountants but say someone is an accountant or they like are a budget specialist and they're like you know what i i'm kind of bored with it i i don't know what to do and i'm like you know the conservation field is growing and i'm getting more interested in it like how do i help how how can i help i'm like get a job with tnc and make sure their budgets are set bring in money for conservation that's how you can help use your skill set for conservation the world i shouldn't say this but we don't need more wildlife biologists while yes we do there's just not a lot of capacity for it we need people that are not strict scientists to help with conservation whatever they're doing you know if they're a construction manager like maybe they can now help out with wetland restoration and i work in those kinds of restoration so whatever it is you're doing that's the kind of like what taylor's saying is like you're working towards something that you care about and it makes you know the boring quote boring part of the job worth it and sometimes those accountants end up becoming pretty badass wildlife pilots because they have to understand. They have to read these proposals. They have to understand where do I put the money so that this program can be successful. And then they got to talk to the people that are doing the work. Right. Exactly. And Ted, I know you're doing a lot of fundraising for your stuff. We talked about that. Like, you know, that's that's the, <laughs> you're you're building that foundation so that all these specialists can go and do all their things. So how's that going? man? How, how, how's the forest (laughs) yeah it's interesting because like you know austin you found your way to fire um in the way that you did and it's it it is strange because i don't feel um as literate in fire um i don't feel as uh comfortable with the fire conversation But it's one of the things that goes with working in conservation in California. You kind of have to know fire a little bit. It it touches all aspects. I mean, even coastal wetlands, (laughs) depending on where you are and depending on what you're working on, Um, it 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 touches all aspects. So that's the that's the way that I came to fire a little bit is just through working on forests. And I don't. I'm not even 
um, remarkably uh, well versed in forestry either. It just so happens that, you know, I spent several years working on forests, um, forest projects for my, my PhD program on the East Coast. Um, and so now I find myself over here in California as I think my title is forestry program director for a nonprofit, it's the Sierra Nevada Alliance. And um, it's kind of cool because the, the field site is the entire Sierra Nevada. And the Sierra, Sierra Nevada goes from the Oregon coast down to approximately Bakersfield um, and, you know, goes from basically the Nevada border um, right outside of Sacramento. So it's it's approximately uh, 500 miles long by approximately 80 to 100 miles wide. Um, and there's a lot of things that can go on in that area, right? And then I guess to back up just a sec, um, the current, I think is secretary of CNRA, California Natural Resource Administration, Wade Crowfoot, has identified four existential threats um, uh, environmental existential threats in California. And they are uh, sea level rise, extreme heat, drought, and catastrophic megafires. And other than the sea level rise, you know, all three of those things uh, are in the Sierra Nevada. And they either have a, you know, great originating factor from the Sierra Nevada um, or uh, are greatly impacted by the Sierra Nevada. So the, the Sierra Nevada is this mountain range that is globally renowned uh, for the majestic views and so many different components, um, wildlife, big trees, big, gorgeous rocks, um, so many things, Lake Tahoe. Uh, but it also, over the last few years, has just been just just hit so hard by these massive fires and so much of California's water, uh, you know, potable water comes from the watersheds that originate in the Sierra Nevada. And so on all these ecosystem services, all the things that humans can benefit from, uh, you find a source in the Sierra Nevada. So one of the approaches with contributing meaningfully to reducing the existential threats of drought, extreme heat, catastrophic megafires, is to really put a lot of attention on the forests. And uh, that can mean different things. In some areas, that can mean uh, the forests are overstocked and we actually need to do what's called fuel load reduction, uh, removing a lot of trees, um, removing, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the fuel, uh, down limbs, uh, just, you know, basically cleaning up the forests. But in some places that can mean um, actually reforestation, places that have like fire scars um, or watersheds that have been, um, you know, hit by, you know, everything from development to, uh, in some cases, earthquakes to fires and actually doing reforestation in there so that we change our relationship to how we get our water. So um, especially in Los Angeles area, Southern California, the idea was to get water very fast away from where the humans are. And that was, we don't want flooding. We don't want all the diseases that come with standing water. And that's why we have the issue of, you know, loss of up to 90% of wetlands in Southern California is because we were trying to get water away to the ocean really quickly. Well, now the approach is slow it, sink it, spread it. And you're trying to get water to stay on the land, but in a, in a meaningful way that's not actually going to hurt humans. And so slowing it, sinking it, spreading it, getting it down into the groundwater, getting it to, you know, meander um, through the watersheds. Uh, and forests and trees are the best way to do that. Uh, you know, increasing the the soil productivity and capacity to um, actually helping that evapotranspiration and all that. So that's what the a forestry program like mine does is it puts people out there working on these sites for those, you know, ecosystem services that help the humans, but then also the not humans. And so my program specifically, um, 
Uh, the lion's share of our work is I manage a workforce development program where I train uh, future forest health professionals, uh, or sorry, current forest health professionals and training them to be the next uh, leaders in essence in the forest health world, um, whether it's here in California or elsewhere. And so these are, it's not an entry level program. It's a mid career, early career um, program where we train folks that know how to work in forests. They know how to run chainsaws. They know how to deal with fire. They know how to plant trees, but they might not have those other skills. They might not know how to manage a budget. For example, we go into the accounting thing. They might not know how to manage a, a multidisciplinary stakeholder, stakeholder meeting. They might not know how to communicate well what they're doing. And so we train folks in those kinds of components. So I have... Right now, we just went through a couple changes. So I think I have 14 staff um, on about 11 projects throughout the Sierra Nevada. And so it's, like I said, the Sierra Nevada is large. And we're, other than just short of Oregon, we're pretty much spread throughout the entire area. And our metrics for the year are just coming in. So um, I'm, I'm putting them together now. So in just in this last year, our team has been responsible for putting two and a half million um, baby trees out into the world um, and putting those out onto the ground. And I think we're at uh, about 800 bushels, the last calculation I did. So bushels about 60 pounds. So um, 800 bushels of cones that have been collected for future reforestations. Um, Cause we, I have a couple of people working at some of the larger nurseries, tree seed nurseries, uh, tree seed nurseries, sorry, tree seed orchards and some of the tree nurseries that um, are kind of the epicenters for that reforestation. I have a quick question about that. Actually, when you're collecting all those cones, are you, selecting for any kind of resilience to bark beetle fungus any of those kinds of things that are have like have damaged the forest over the last 20 30 40 years yeah they're they're doing some cool things the 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 cone collectors uh so we work um primarily with our 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 strongest partner is american forests and american forests um i'm probably going to get it wrong but i think they are the oldest conservation nonprofit in the United States. I could have that wrong, but they're a very old uh, environmental nonprofit, really amazing. Um, and, you know, started with a relationship with forests and trying to protect forests. And they've got an, a remarkable leadership team um, that is very innovative. And they are trying to do some really cool things. One of the cool things that they've done is they've created what they call their cone core, and so it's a team um, that they're just now developing the protocols and how to go about collecting these cones. So that is one of the metrics that they're looking for is like, what trees do we go for? Um, but then it's also open to the caprices of the environment. So for instance, last year, the cone collection was dismal, but that was strictly because the trees weren't pumping out cones. And this year, my team, worked for like I don't know how they put in as many hours as they did they all of them are exhausted they worked in like June July August all the way through September just collecting cones like crazy and everything from they do really rad things they have these like amazing slingshots that go on these like long sticks and they shoot um these like lines up to get into the trees and they climb the trees and they go through and they actually collect them to um uh, different, just a variety of collection methods. So they, these are amazing humans that are climbing these trees and doing the best they can, trying to search out the trees that they want for that next generation. It's pretty cool. So you're telling the kids at home that keep climbing <laughs> those trees because one day you got a job collecting cones. It's weird, but it's true. That's exactly it. It's weird, but it's true. That's a job. Yeah. And again, it goes back to all, all the dynamics of what a conservation biologist or person in conservation may end up doing at any given yeah. day. 
to get the job it's done. It's a yeah. it's a common theme of people we talk to. Like, hey, how did you get started? And so, like, oh, I was outside, just like in the dirt, grabbing you know things out of the mud. And my parents were like, "What are you doing?" And it's like, and I just kind of slowly. <laughs> that's what I did for work <laughs> over yep. 20, 30 years. And it's like same thing. Like, I like climbing trees, and so now I'm a tree biologist that like, collect cones. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. No, that's it. Well, and that's that is exactly it. But um, uh, when I hire people. That's what I say. It's necessary, but insufficient. So yeah, you love trees. That's great. Everyone and their mom loves trees. What makes you different? And it's like, well, I know how to climb trees and I know how to identify the cones and I know how to get that done and I can do that for you. All right, there we go. And so it's adding this passion to kind of what you were talking about earlier, Austin is like, okay, well, say you're an accountant and you want to get into the environmental world. You have a skill set that very few folks in this world have. And so that's that marriage between the two. So you definitely don't want just the accountant that doesn't have any knowledge whatsoever, but you definitely don't want the person that just like, I love nature and I love to hike. It's that marriage of those two that makes for a really a special conservationist, at least in my experience. Yeah. And your experience, Taylor, is is really special and unique you have pretty much been a part except i don't think you've worked for the government but you've <laughs> you've been in academics for longer than you want to admit right um you work with a lot of nonprofits, some small ones that were frustrating but you learned a lot as part of them you started a consulting firm um and, and you've done a lot of volunteer work yourself just going out and saying hey here's a thing i'm gonna go out and be just be a volunteer how has that played into you know the challenges that that you're facing now with this large massive forest that has so many unique problems uh how does being so multiplied disciplinary in, in your in your background and the organizations you've worked with help you yeah man it is true it is longer than i'd like to admit working in academia um <laughs> but but all these different components i don't know my my brain goes to a couple places first is I didn't intend to get into conservation. Um, like I said, I got into it because I was protesting the Iraq war in 2001 or 2002. And I was out on a march, my very first march with a sign. And I was like out there and I went, oh, this isn't really doing anything. And I was like, well, wait a second, I'm not really doing anything. How do I contribute? How do I contribute meaningfully to, you know, the world? And I tried a bunch of different things. Um, I tried, like, I, I, I volunteered at a soup kitchen, uh, bringing food to folks that, you know, couldn't, didn't have access to food. And I was, I, that was not for me. That was, that was beyond my capacities. Um, the next thing I did, I tried, I volunteered at a children's hospital reading books to sick kids. And I did not have the emotional capacity oh, for that either. That's got to be so hard. Yeah. And it, I think I tried like two or three other things. And then I, I signed up, I saw like an ad in a paper. It was like, help uh, this native plant garden. I had no idea what that was. It shows how old you are. You were looking at the paper for a job. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's the, the gray in the beard. Um, and I just showed up and the guy gave me a hose and he said, just water the plants. And I just started watering the plants. And then like eight hours later, I was like, oh, hey, I'm done. He's like, you're still here. <laughs> <laughs> and then I showed up the next day and he's like, you're not going away. Um, and it was just, it was just something about it that I found interesting. Um, maybe it was cause I wasn't dealing with people or something. I don't know, but, um, it, it, and then I just kind of went with it and I realized like, Oh my God, there's all these different humans working with sick kids and working on anti-war stuff or on this. And all of those are valuable, but that's not me. That's not my strength. And for whatever reason, nature, nurture, whatever it is, I found my path with conservation. So, and I kind of got good at different aspects of it. Um, but I think that helped inform, 
I don't know. It's it's always it's always challenging to do a post rational analysis on you know why you did what you did, but it does help inform. Like I don't I don't see conservation as like a natural science field. I see it more as a social justice experience, um, and I think because of that, I I see it. Yes, it helps. It has an anthropogenic contribution. It helps humans. But far more than that, it helps the non-human parts of our world. And for me, I think that's just social justice in an extended circle. And so how that relates to the work that I'm doing, I don't know. I found my path through so many different things and so many different interests that I have. And I don't see these arbitrary barriers that we have. So for instance, when I was working in um, the East Coast, when I was working on my PhD, I was helping to, I don't know what to call it, understand um, a 20,000 acre forest that uh, was under threat of being lost to development and under threat of being lost to um, a variety of of poor management strategies. and there was a fear of it being clear cut to death. There was a fear of it being lost to like the Walmart developments. And as we were going, the first thing that I did, I was like, well, what, who are the different stakeholders in this? And then when we pulled together the stakeholders, I realized that none of the indigenous people were identified. And so I started talking to a lot of folks and everyone told me, well, that was so long ago that the indigenous people lived here that they don't they're kind of irrelevant to our current day management strategy. And I was like, oh, okay, that's fair. Um, you know, cause like, where do you draw the line? Um, should I look into the, uh, the saber tooth cats and the mammoths that actually lived here um, 10,000 years ago? Like well, you got to draw a line somewhere. So I understood that. And as we were going through the project, I realized more and more that the understanding and protection of this forest involved understanding the history of the people that lived there. And it used to be a land that was um, a cotton plantation that was run by, uh, that was worked on by itinerant white folk, um, poor white folk. And then before that it was run, it was slavery agriculture. And we weren't examining that. And so I had to look into that and I had to talk to the ancestors of the enslaved peoples that worked that land before it was a forest. But then I was like, okay, well, it would, before it was a forest, it was a cotton plantation. But before it was a cotton plantation, it was a forest. And who lived in that forest? And we realized that it was the Cherokee people. Oh my God, the Trail of Tears in essence started at this forest. And so I was like, I can't, I would be doing this project and my own research a disservice if I didn't call them and ask and and see what their opinion was. And that was a three month negotiation uh, of calling them and seeing like, Hey, can we talk about this? And finally, when we got there, the first thing that they said to me, they said, you're the first white person since I think 1812 to call them and ask for their opinion on the management of this land. And right there, that opened up, oh my God, you guys keep records that long? Um, Oh my God, no one else has asked you for your opinion on what this land is? Um, What is your perspective? So that perspective had never been integrated before. And so through some of the work that I was able to do in protecting this forest, we were able to integrate multiple voices that had never been concerned, had been of concern before. And that is now informing how the management of the forest and the, and the valuation of that forest is occurring. And so it's through experiences like that, we're not seeing the arbitrary boundaries between what is a human society and what is a, a natural environment um, has helped me and, and helps me with my current job when I'm talking to people about why they care about the forest and where they live. Yeah, well, that's a lot of time in academics, Taylor. <laughs> but I love it. I love it because, yeah, you, you had to go through that, right? And w- when we take on these higher education projects, you're put out there and you care more about this project than anybody else. And you have to dive yeah. into it. You got to figure out your ways. And you don't realize those intangible things that, that you're learning that are going to help you actually in your professional world uh, uh, of how to solve problems. 
right? So yeah. solve big problems that nobody cares about. Except for you. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Because I, you know, people say like, you know, I unfortunately I've reached an age where people start asking me like, hey, how do I get into this field? I'm like, oh man, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know how to answer that question. And but I always just kind of say this like what we we're just talking about here. Like, you know, Taylor and I have a wide variety of experience, just kind of inadvertently because we just couldn't figure out. Really, I was trying to figure out how to get paid to do what I was doing. <laughs> so I was just balancing from job to job being like, you know, I'm not get, making enough money or I'm not making any money. So how do I get paid? And so inadvertently, I got a wide variety of experience. Like you said, Taylor has nonprofit experience and academic. And the only thing he doesn't have, like you said, is government. But I have plenty of government and military installation experience and all that kind of stuff. So it's uh, that's what I would say is like, if you actually do want to be like a conservation leader, uh, eventually is like, that's how you do it. You just like you have a wide variety of experience because then you can understand when certain problems arise and what's going on with them. So I, I was stoked to hear about you talking about the government having the logo and a mascot because, you know, that's what's cool about conservation is we got to come up with fun ways to market it. And even if you're working for something that seems rigid, like the federal government, it's still important to like, yeah, the, 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 this little rat. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we're gonna light this thing's fire uh, tail on fire and, and show you <laughs> wh wh why the story is important. Uh, and that brings us to, to something that is at the heart of this organization that we're all a part of, which, which you guys are, you know, really the spearheads for. And that's the story of Pelicanus occidentalis. And that that story is just such a badass conservation story. I know you guys interweave it every so often into your your episodes, but you know. That's a marine bird. You guys are talking about stuff that you're doing inland, but I, I feel like that marine bird, you, you chose that one for a reason. Why, why that bird? Yeah, the the story is a conservation success story. You know, it's uh, the idea behind the uh, pelicanus as a name is from he said pelicanus occidentalis, which is the uh, California brown pelican, um, was essentially almost extinct in the 60s and 70s and then <clears throat> through directed research they figured out why it was a chemical called ddt which is a um, pesticide and it, it bioaccumulates in the food web so as you kind of go up the food chain it uh the, the species at the top of the food chain kind of get that chemical at high concentrations and it uh does bad things and essentially for these birds what it does is it stops their calcium uptake so when they would sit on their eggs uh, before they hatched, their eggs would just crush. So they, cause like the calcium wasn't, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, good enough. <laughs> and so essentially they did that research, they figured out what the problem is. And then as a society, we fixed that problem. And so that's, that's the flagship. That's the goal is like when it comes to climate change, when it comes to habitat loss, when it comes to fire regime changes, whatever we're talking about, that's what we're trying to do is as a society come together and say, this is important to us. Let's bring these things back. Not because the pelican itself is intrinsically valuable to us, which it is, but because this is something we realize is important for the continuation of not only our species, but all species. And it, is kind of just like a like a, a mascot, a, an example, a, a figurehead, and really wanted to do it on the California condor, which is a very similar thing. They're not doing as well as the uh, pelicans, but you know, Jim No Gyps isn't a, as a catchy as a of a name as Pelicanus. Um, but yeah, that's basically. And there's a couple like the bald eagle, the uh, you know, the high apex predator uh, raptors and, and birds, all went through the same thing and. Um, there are some really big conservation story, uh, success stories that we are kind of using as our, our guiding light. But then, you know, our whole idea is to take those examples and highlight the, you know, quote, smaller. Like the one I'm trying to think of is the, the episode we did, the three barred bandicoot in Australia. Because it's like the cutest little marsupial, I think it was. Um, and they took it off the endangered species list through 30 years of direct research and effort and volunteer time. And someone, organizations, governments, you know, at all different levels said, this is something we want to change. 
let's change it. 30 years later, the species is back. And now the guy who like started the program or is like head, head of the program for a long time has him in his front yard. And I recommend listening to that episode or watching that episode because it's, it's a pretty cool one. Um, no, more, more than that, though, it wasn't just that it was uh, endangered. It was it was I think it was extinct in the wild. Yep. yep. Like they, they did a plus two on that. So they brought it back from extinct in the wild to either endangered or threatened. Like to, but regardless, they're in the guy's yard. So, I mean, just a, that's a remarkable story. And the idea is, you know, there's so many of these stories around the world um, and there's so many communities like we're just talking about what we're doing here in Southern California and the Sierra Nevada. Like every single community in every single country has something like this, you know, whether it's just like a women's group in, you know, sub-Saharan Uganda, like, and they're just doing whatever they can to make, you know, their lives more, uh, you know, might make their lives better through sustainable farming or whatever. It goes back to Dr. Gladys, where she's getting people to do more sustainable farming and have sustainable incomes to protect gorillas while also helping their communities. So like every different area of the world has something like this. And so we have an unending possibility for episodes because <laughs> like, there's just so much going on. We just got to figure out how to speak different languages so we can talk to people in other countries. <laughs> oh, you're speaking the language of conservation really well, which I, I think both of you really, we want to admit it or not, education is, is, a, is a core value. And I, I think what you guys are doing here, bringing these stories uh, to the forefront, no matter how big or small or remote or in the middle of uh, massive populations, uh, people need to know that this is going on um, and, and the positivity at angle, right? So that's that's where you're, you, you get your namesake from is from a positive story. Uh, th that's what keeps us going. <laughs> yeah, and we, we, say it's, it's ironic because we did it to kind of share these stories and highlight people and, you know, you know, it's not about us, it's about like highlighting the folks that are doing this cool work and all the great work they've done. But we found that like doing this regularly has really helped us continue to do our jobs without feeling bogged down with the, the BS. And it really has helped us. So we're like, well, at least it's helping us. If no one listens, it's like, well, we're feeling like we're feeling better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, that is actually weirdly true. The, going through this process since 2015, Austin, is that how long we've been? Yeah, we've been doing. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. It has changed my perspective on conservation because I, I think naturally I also mean to show it, it's a testament to like, you know, uh, the adaptability and plasticity of human nature is uh, I know that naturally I am a very cynical, um, skeptical, probably negative person. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's weird by going through this process, I have, I'm still probably cynical, skeptical and negative, um, but it has greatly uh, affected how open-minded I am, um, uh, how I'm now like, my default isn't any more like the world is screwed and we're it, like, it's all over, like, which is where my head was when I started. Um, it, and so it has changed the way that I see the world to the point now. And it is even, it feels weird saying this. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh just came out with a book just right before he passed away a couple years ago. Um, Zen and the art of saving the planet. And he was asked when he was doing his Vietnam war protests, the one that he was nominated for the Nobel peace prize for, um, they asked him, you know, how can you do this in the light of all this death and all this agony? And he said, you know, I don't see it that way. I see the world is perfect and it's still worth working on. And to have somebody say that in the light of like your everyone, you know, is getting killed um, is just an astounding thing. But he then carried that over to his work with environmental stuff. And, you know, he now he was then encouraging people, him and his his priests and monks were encouraging people to see it that way instead it is actually perfect as it is and it is still worth working on and when i first read that i was like you are nuts <laughs> and it, it's because of this work with pelicanus um and influences like Thich Nhat Hanh um that 
I'm more and more seeing the world that way. And I, that's weird to me. <laughs> like I, I would never have guessed like, that's how like that has changed the, my perspective um, from such a cynical um, person. So Yeah, definitely. You guys are two of the most analytical people I know <laughs> when, you're, <laughs> when you're analytical like that. And I talk to you guys about things all the time. Like this is so wrong. Like this needs to be fixed. And often we're talking about things that we can't fix or even try, yeah. uh, but it's good yeah. to see people taking on those things that are wrong and, and fixing them. And then obviously sometimes in our day to days, we, we also get to you know, create, create solutions, uh, you know, behind the veil a little bit, if there is a veil for Peliconis, I think one of the other aspects that's just super rad about it is the group of people that you've brought together. Yeah. Um, and uh, clearly we're like conservation brothers. Well, you guys are actually brothers, but I consider <laughs> you guys like, you know, you are my conservation friends, right? And and we we become friends um, through through our passion for uh, natural systems. Uh, but uh, we have other things in common, and I think the, the Peliconis board is cool because we all have these different interests. So we were just talking about the, you know the MBA to, to start off our, our, our last board meeting, um, which is fun, and that is also what's great about our industry is you, you meet people and it's not always like super tight and buttoned up. Like we're just going to talk about biology or, you know, conservation. <laughs> you get in the field with these people and you, you, you find out more about them and, and yeah. other interests and things. And that's really fun about our industry. I, I get to share myself and learn about other people, which has its other rewards, right? Yeah, we've got a great group. We've got a lot of people that are really influential in, in conservation. Like, you know, we've talked about all the work you guys are doing at Tidal Influence. And, you know, we've got some people that work at the San Diego Zoo. And we've got some people that are not even in conservation, but they are really, really like helpful and like uh, pro programmatically, but also just like coming up with ideas and brainstorming just because they're coming up from a different perspective. So, yeah, we, 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 uh, we love the group that we have. And, you know, it's uh we were talking about this at our last board meeting we're we're proud of what we've built you know you know <laughs> looking at the numbers we're not as like big as we'd want to be because we want these stories to get out to as many people as possible um you know not for like <laughs> like and you know like comment subscribe kind of type of things but it's also like we just want to share these stories but we're st we're very very proud of what we've done and and uh you know it's with that group we'll be able to build something pretty cool and and that's all austin that's all your vision too i remember when we because we originally we weren't a nonprofit. austin just wanted to create a podcast and then when we decided to go and turn into a nonprofit, uh i was talking to austin <laughs> and i said okay the last thing you want to do is just have a fill your board full of a bunch of friends <laughs> um you want people that actually can contribute to like the mission of the organization. And what did he do? He created a board full of all of his friends. Um, but the cool part about that is that all of his friends have amazing skills and abilities to help to meaningfully contribute toward the betterment of a nonprofit. So I think there was a, there was a lot of vision and wisdom in Austin's decision there. Cause you know, what are you doing if you're not doing amazing things with amazing people? Yeah, we can maybe we can call this our, our almost almost ten year anniversary episode to kind of yeah. talk about uh, all the things that we've done. But you know, we started the nonprofit in August twenty twenty, so it's that's been four years. Yeah. So, yeah, it's uh, yeah. it's pretty cool. And again, like it's all about the stories that we're we're, we're telling, and and just, there's just so so many really cool stories of positive and you know success stories, and even if they're not success. Again, we say this all the time when people say like, I don't really, I'm working on this species and the species is still declining. Like we're talking about the Mount Yellow Good Frog earlier, like it's kind of not doing well. It's like, yeah, but the fact that you're spending eight to 10 hours a day, five days a week working on recovering that, that's the cool story. Like we, all the things we've talked about recently with the you know aquarium and the Pacific and all these people doing firework, it's like they're trying to make it better. And that's what we're highlighting. And that's as, to me, that's as cool as it gets. Thank you again for listening. You can find our website at pelicanus.org. Check the episode description for links to the programs we've talked about in this episode. You can also check us out on social media at Pelicanus Inc. Hosts and producers are Austin Parker, Taylor Parker, and Eric Zahn. Music was provided by a Picture Book Studios. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe if you want to help. Thanks again. We'll talk to you next time.